let's start with the Varroa mite then, with the Varroa destructor. First, it was first found in this country in 1982, and it was bombarded with chemicals from then until now, really. So the, the approach, and Anne's approach is a good approach, isn't it, really, to get away from the chemicals and to look at other, other methods. Um, but from 1982, it started off with something called pyrethroids, uh, which are insect it's an insecticide, or they're insecticides. So they damage bees as well as killing mites. And it's a matter of all, of all of the solutions to the varroa mite have always involved poisoning the bees, but poisoning the varroa mites more than the bees. So, so you're hoping that you don't destroy the hive, but you get rid of the mites. And pyrethroids were the first thing. And they worked for a few years until the mites became resistant, and presumably the bees. <laughs> And then thymol was used as an alternative because, because the pyrethroids weren't working. And after a few years, thymol became ineffective. And the latest thing now are organic acids. So people use formic acid and oxalic acid. And once you get to formic acid, you have to be incredibly careful about the levels of, uh, you know, the actual relative amount that you give the bees because you can kill the bees very easily. So, so I'm all with an and on that. It clearly is a very stupid approach, really, because all you're doing like the rest of, in the rest of agriculture is creating resistance in, in, in animals, and you're actually doing them probably as much damage as you're doing good. And there are some side effects to that as well. I mean, there was a, there was a mite in this country up until 1982. I don't think it's seen anymore. I think it's extinct. It was called Browler. It was a mite that was native to this country, so it wasn't introduced like Varroa destructor from the Far East. It, it was always here, and it always lived with bees, so they'd evolved together. And it's thought, although it's very difficult to prove now because it's not around, but it's thought that, that that mite was a cleaner mite in the hive. So it kept the bees clean, it got rid of the detrius, moved stuff out. But the chemicals that were used back in 1982 effectively did for that mite, so another good reason not to use chemicals. The Varroa mite, or Browler, the native mite, they're not the first mites. If we went back to 1904, and particularly the 1920s, there was another mite. And in fact, at the time, there was a disease, a really terrible disease. That people didn't really know what it was, but lo colonies were dying all over the place, just like in 1982. So the beekeeping population, or the bee number of beehives, reduced dramatically over quite a short period. And then it was identified, and it's quite difficult to identify this, it was identified, the problem was, a mite. It, at the time they called it Isle of Wight disease, because it started in the Isle of Wight. And, and this mite, turned out, was a mite that was living in the trachea of the bee. So it was living in the bee's throat, and it was feeding off the, the food that the bee ate, and starving the bees. That's what was happening, weakening the colonies. It, it, it's, lots of similarities, really, in all these mites. And acarin uh, was finally identified, but, of course, we're back in the 1920s, or the, the teens, yeah, so it's like 100 years ago. We didn't have the technology, they didn't have the technology we have now, or the chemicals, or the laboratories. So I think it was ignored, really, and eventually, you know, by now, for example, the acarin might is still around, you occasionally see it, you have to dissect to be, to actually see if it's got a mite in its trachea. But very occasionally, you do find bees uh, with, with, with the acarin mite, and they're living, you know, and they survive. So, you know, I think what's happened, what happened there was, uh, from 1920s to now, that mite has been a part of the bee population for the whole period, and we've reached the point where perhaps, given that a bee could, at its maximum, have 17 broods of babies a year, you have a lot of, a lot of turnover of bees, and a lot of ability for the stronger ones to survive, and the ones that can resist the, the acrid mites become prevalent. So we have acrid now, we had it then, and now people don't call it, you know, the scourge of beekeeping or the the thing that's the most, the biggest problem, as, as it actually was at one point. So there's a parallel there, really, between this acrimite and between the varroa destructor mite. There are lots of pests that affect bees. Most of them are introduced, quite a lot of them from the Far East. All of them are bad, <laughs> and all of them probably should have better controls. So an open border policy isn't necessarily the best thing for bees, or farming generally. So there are lots of problems. And the sarin is a very good one. I think that probably has had as big an effect on bees as varroa destruction in the last 10 years. It came from the Far East in sometime in the, in the noughties. There's an old name for this as well, because there was always a, a, a protozoa called Nazima around. It had, a, it had an old-fashioned name called spring dwindle, and it meant when your bees came through the winter, they didn't develop as you'd like them to, as they would normally. They didn't sort of build up in a hive. They just were lethargic and, and they didn't really go anywhere. So for a long time, the spring went dwindle before it was known what this process was. And now it's known as, as Nazima. Right, so that's a little bit of history. And what I'm trying to say there, really, is that Varroa destructor is a terrible pest, really. It's not a good thing. It's been dealt with, probably, in my opinion, in a pretty poor way. Uh, and Anne's approach is pretty good, 
but a bit um, risky perhaps, I don't know, you know, started to, to genetically modify the bees by introducing particular characteristics artificially is, is, is a little worrying to me. I would rather see people breeding bees themselves, and I'll come to this in a minute when we look at natural, his, natural history, but breeding bees themselves and looking at those bees that have the best characteristics, and, and one of the characteristics would clearly be their ability to deal with varroa. The natural history of the honeybee. If you're a wild honeybee, and I like the fact that there should, there should be more wild honeybees, but there aren't, and there aren't for all of the reasons that we're talking about here, really, and all the reasons we haven't talked about yet. Um, but if, you, if you're a honeybee, you find a, a home, there's a queen, you, you'll fly off in a swarm, so their natural way of reproduction is splitting. Swarms are bees' ways of reproducing. A colony splits into two, and what remains splits again, but like Russian dolls, bees are. They keep splitting until, until there aren't really enough bees to want to split again, and that stays in the old nest. But all of the other ones would have created lots of potential new colonies, and they will fly off and they will find a home. <laughs> And historically, if we went about 300 years, naturally that would be a hole in a tree. And um, they would go there and they would start to make a new nest. And that nest, and they would either thrive or not, you know, depending on how well they did, what the weather was like, how good the hole in the tree was. And then the following year, the whole thing would start over again. They'd have done brilliantly well. They'd split, half of them would fly off. And that naturally is how it works. However, there's something else about bees as well. A single nest has a finite lifespan. So it doesn't live, it doesn't go on for a hundred years. So if someone says, oh, I've got bees in my chimney, they've been there forever. That isn't actually true. And the reason it's not true is that when bees create honeycomb, um, they'll build the honeycomb in the cavity that's available to them. So let's say it's a hole in a tree and it's this big. In a year, or at most two, they'll fill that hole with honeycomb as they grow. And what will happen is, if the queen was actually laying continuously in the same cell through the whole year, she could have 17 lots of baby bees. Each egg that she lays, as we saw on the film, when it hatches, it creates a paper cocoon in the cell. If you were to look at honeycomb after, after it's been used by bees for breeding, it's darker. Where the honey store is always light, but where the bees are breeding, it's darker. And the reason for that is it has this paper coating. And each new generation of bee puts another paper coating in. So it's, so it's own sort of little um, clean environment. So if you've done 10 generations, you've got 10 little pieces of paper, <laughs> very thin. So over time, the space available for the bees gets smaller and eventually unusable. So all, all colonies of bees in the wild have a finite life. So they would live for, I, I reckon, probably three to four years. I mean, it depends on the cavity. So a huge cavity, obviously, they can just keep moving it along. But if you've got a small cavity, then once it's filled and once they've used it a few times, that colony dies. However, hopefully what it will have done is it will have split and created more bees many times in that time. So it doesn't matter that it dies because it's already, it's already generated lots of swarms. And then what happens after it's died is wax moths and wasps and all sorts of other things come in and they eat all of that old comb. So, and they'll eat it down to nothing, but leaving obviously a smell of wax. <laughs> and a swarm the next year will come along and go, oh, it's a perfect home really. It even smells like home and starts again. <laughs> So, so that's, the life, that's the life cycle. So bees, in other words, naturally, in one situation, they have a certain lifespan. Um, and that's quite significant, I think, because uh, there's something else I want to tell you about, which is that there was a guy called Langstroth, and again, maybe you'll know this, who back in, I think, 1870-something, um, invented the uh, bee space, i.e. the space that a bee requires that, it, that means it will not build wax frames, um, and, it, and it also won't build uh, what's called um, brace cones. So it won't try and glue up holes or it won't try and build a new, a new frame. It's the perfect space for a bee. So what, you then, what he then did is say, well, if we have wooden frames, we can put them all alongside each other with wax on them, and the bees will use those wooden frames, and that means that we can manage them. So up until that point, you couldn't do that. You, know, you couldn't do that. What you had to do was have a straw basket let the bees go, go in, catch the swarm, put it in the, swarm, in the straw basket, and then it would fill the straw basket with wax. And what you would do, always, in those days, was within 18 months, you would, you would cull some of them and take the honey and the wax as the like, farmed produce, basically. You'd start with one beehive in a straw basket. You wanted it to swarm. That's another big difference to say. Most beekeepers don't want their bees to swarm. They should want them to swarm, because for lots of reasons. Not least because... Well, they should want them to show the desire to swarm, 
so that they can split them and create more, more colonies. But most beekeepers would rather their bees didn't swarm and they just got lots of honey. If you went back to Victorian times and before, you'd have a, a skep, you would want it to swarm, you had no choice but to let it swarm. You couldn't go in and meddle around with it because it's all sort of glued up inside. And so when it swarmed, and I also remember this is anecdotal now, but you'd usually, because the labour was cheap, you'd have a young boy that watched your bees through May and June, and if they swarmed, his job would be to follow the bees with a tin banging it, because I think, and I could be wrong, but I think it's on the statute books in this country that if you're chasing bees and banging a saucepan, they belong to you. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I think it's supposed to say is if you're chasing bees and banging a saucepan, it's like thunder, and bees come to ground if they think it's going to rain. So, but whether that's true or not, that's what they used to do. But you'd, the, you'd want to catch that swarm, bring it back, and put it in another basket. And then when the colony swarmed again, as it would, you know, the, the second, the, the, what are called cast swarms, smaller swarms, the Russian dolls, smaller and smaller, you'd want to cast, catch them as well and put them in baskets. So your single colony would become four or five colonies even. And then what we, we would then do is that would be the spring. In the summer, in September, you would cull the, the first two, which is the original colony, which is now 18 months old, and the prime swarm which is the queen, because the queen swarms first, those little cast swarms are princesses, so they're, they're young queens that haven't mated yet. You'd cull the first two colonies, the older ones, and then all of the young, all of the cast, which are princesses, i.e. this year's queens, would be kept and would run through to the next year. So that's how it works. So, so in the same way as in the wild, where in the wild, bees would have a finite life, farmed bees would also would also have a finite life, because that was the only way they, they knew to manage it, because they didn't know about this bee space thing. So now I've got to draw some conclusions from that. And firstly, the variety structure tonight, bad as it is, isn't the only problem. So I, hadn't, I haven't even, like Anand, I haven't even touched on environmental issues, or pesticides, or farming practices, all of which I think are hugely more significant than the varroa mice. Hugely more. And, and that's pretty well illustrated by just about everything that's happening now. You know, we've got the lowest recorded number of butterflies on record this year. Uh, toads are two thirds down, is it, since 2012? Uh, I haven't seen any rabbits. <laughs> I mean, and, and I think the list goes on and on. I was even listening to the radio before it came out, and they were talking about how we're losing 2% of species a year globally. That's only 50 years, and they're all gone. So I think, and I think a lot of that is down to. I mean, the number of people probably, but it's down to farming practices, how we're dealing with the environment, global warming, the use of pesticides and chemicals. I think they're all huge issues. So I think we should look at Anand's an, an, an film and appreciate it as a fantastic piece of film and understand that the Varroa mite is something, through no fault of its own, was brought over here from Japan, where, by the way, it lives perfectly happily with Apis serrana. Apis mellifera serrana, which is the Japanese honeybee, so perfectly happy there. Uh, and it will be perfectly happy here at some point. <laughs> and look at the real issues. I think that's why I'm getting at. There are some real issues that are much more important than a, than a single mind.